Wow, we are so glad that you are with us. If you are visiting with us at Trading for today, we want you to know how grateful we are that you've chosen to come worship the Lord with us uh, on this Sunday. So uh, welcome, welcome. If you have uh, never filled out one of our connection cards, um, in the seat backs there should be some little cards, and if you'd like to just... Uh, and would please take time to just jot down a name, uh, maybe an email address or a phone number, a way where we can just have some uh, record of your, your visit with us today. Well, a couple of things I want to share before we get into the Word. Um, I want to share a special prayer request. Uh, this coming week, on July the 18th, Andrew Brunson, who is being held in prison in Turkey. Uh, he's been there serving the Lord, pastoring a church for years. But church, do we believe in prayer? I mean, seriously, when we call on the Lord, do we believe that He hears? Yes, He does hear and He answers when His children call out to Him. And so I want us to have a special prayer for Andrew Brunson, and would you be lifting him up with me as he comes up again this coming week for another trial before the, the, the authorities in the land of Turkey there. Pray not only for him, but pray for his family. They've been separated since 2016, and, and so they really need our prayer support. As a matter of fact, I got a real reminder of that when I was doing some of my Bible reading this past week. Um, in Colossians 4, 18, when Paul closed his letter, uh, he, he said, remember my chains. Remember my chains. He was in prison. And he said, remember where I'm at and what I'm going through. Just pray for me. So church... Let's pause right now to have a special prayer. Father, we lift up the Brunson family. They've been through so much already, but your grace has been sufficient for every trial they faced. And I pray for Andrew as he goes before that, that judge next week. I pray for favor, for divine favor, in spite of, the Lord, the circumstances. We, we just pray that, that he'll get a fair hearing Lord, the charges are really muddy. Uh, he's been accused of some things, but there's, Lord, no proof that he's done anything except try to live for Jesus in a place where Christians are, are rare and they're scarce. So help him to shine even in the middle of that dark place and comfort and strengthen his family in all that they're going through. We pray that you would continue to just bless in every part of the service, especially as your holy word is open and explained. May you bless it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we have a, a special treat for you. I'm looking forward to this, and I know that you will be too. Just a few weeks ago, we received into our fellowship some new members. Uh, Lucy and Steve Wilson. And for a number of years, Steve pastored First Baptist Church in China Grove. And I wanted you to have a special introduction to Steve and also uh, uh, to get to know him a little better. I couldn't think of any other way than for us to give him the opportunity to bring a message on Sunday morning. Next Sunday, I will be right back in that series, Model Church, from uh, the book of Titus. We'll be in Titus chapter 2 next Sunday. But for today, how about making welcome to the pulpit here at Trading Forward, Steve Wilson. God bless you, Steve. Come and bring God's Word to us. I love you, brother. God bless you. I love you, too. Thanks, man. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And while you're doing that, let me just say thank you to our, our new church family. You have received us and loved us and encouraged us, and, and many of you have shared your prayer concerns for us, and I just want to say thank you. 
And I also want to say thank you to you, Pastor Mike. You've been a good friend for, for many years. And, and I find this a privilege that you've given me today. This is a sacred spot that I'm standing in. And I don't take it for granted. And I just ask God to bless our time together. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you're in this place. And that you've given us opportunity to connect with you. Father, I, I want to step aside and get out of the way. And I want Jesus to be seen. Father, the, the sins of this son of yours are many. And Lord, I just thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you for the opportunity, God, that we can see you this morning. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 47 years ago. I proposed to Lucy by asking her to make Psalm 34, verse 3, our lifetime verse. And it goes like this. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Isn't that a great verse for a Christian? Isn't that a great verse for the church? God desires for us to magnify him and exalt his name together. I, I read about a man who was studying the moon in his back porch. And on a clear night, he, he went out with his binoculars and he settled them on the rail so that they would be still. And, and he began to look at the moon and he magnified the moon. And it became big in his eyes. And then he was overwhelmed with the mountains and, 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 and the craters and, and the rough edges. And my friend, when we come to worship with that image in mind, that's what should happen in this place or in your quiet time. When we begin to focus on God and make him big in our minds, and then we become overwhelmed with his wisdom and his beauty and his awesomeness, and his grace, and his mercy. Worship. God desires that from all of us. And when that happens, the next verse in Psalm 34, 3 comes into play. And when God is magnified in our minds, and in our hearts, and in our eyes, we begin to exalt him, and to worship him. You know, after almost 2,000 years of the church age, you'd kind of think we got this worship down pat, wouldn't you? Anybody agree with me that we're far from that? In churches and in individual Christian lives? You know, in this day and age, we worship about anything. Talk to me from, from where you are. What are some of the gods that people have today? Money. Money. What else? TV. Celebrities. I mean, we're full of gods these days. And there are some religions that want to include a lot of other religions because they just don't want to leave any little god out. As we think of worship today, return with me to a conversation between a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well as she speaks to Jesus. Notice on your screen the words. And the woman said to them, now, I'm going to stop here. Anybody old enough to remember that saying that, that children are to be seen and what? Well, guess what happened in that day? That included women as well. And she speaks to Jesus, which she wasn't supposed to do. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. I hope today that you know he's more than a prophet. He is the Son of God who has actually come to this earth, took on human flesh, and died in your place so your sins could be forgiven. She continues, Our Father worshipped in this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim in the Samaritan area. And you people, did you catch that? You people. See, Jesus was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. And there was great displeasure between the two. She continues again. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. 
You worship what you do not know. Stop. Let that sink in. Do you intimately know the one that we've gathered to worship this morning? You worship who you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, you know, I know that the Messiah is coming. He is called the Christ. And, and, and when that one comes, whoo, he will declare all things to us. Surprise, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I want to start by talking about what false worship is before we can understand what real worship is. First off, false worship is selective worship. False religion chooses what it wishes to know about God and omits the rest. You know, those Samaritans, they believed the Scriptures, but they only wanted to take the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah, and they regarded the rest as irrelevant. You know, there are many Christians I call buffet Christians. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, they, they pick and choose what tastes good to them. And that's all that matters. See, over the years, Brother Mike, I have worshipped in Catholic churches, in Episcopal churches, in Lutheran churches, in Methodist churches. I didn't agree with all that they were talking about, but I worshipped there and numerous Baptist churches. I mean, I've worshipped with contemporary music and traditional music. I've worshipped in high church settings and jumping the pew services. But false worship is very selective. It is where my preferences have to be met before I will worship. It's sad to say. But when I was pastoring at First Baptist Church, I know you'll have a hard time believing this, but we had some folks leave the church because we included contemporary music in our worship. But however, we also had people leave the church because we included traditional music in our worship. See, false worship has more to do with the worshiper than it does the one who should be worshipped. Do you let your preferences interfere with your worship? See, false worship also is slanted worship. God desires worship in spirit and in truth. Not one or the other, but both. Now, I have to make a confession here. When Jesus spoke about worshiping him in spirit, he wasn't talking about the Holy Spirit, or he would have said the Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong, the Holy Spirit is got to be absolutely in the middle of our worship. Amen? But he's talking about spiritual worship. And you're aware, are you not, that you're a trinity just like God. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a what? Spirit. And when Jesus was speaking here, he wasn't talking about worship of the body. You, you see, that's where I got to be in a certain place. That's what the woman said, right? I, I got to be up on this mountain. And, and, and I got to be in my pew, or I got to be in my seat, and, and I've got to be doing certain things like singing, like crossing myself, like kneeling in the aisle. I got to do some certain things. Now, listen, my body is involved every time I worship God, but it's got to be more than that. And it's not worship of the soul. You see, the seed of our feelings is in our soul. How many of you have teared up in a service? How many of you felt joy in a service? Yes, that, that often happens, does it not? But you can do both of those and never really worship. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be worship of the Spirit. That's when your spirit connects with God who is Spirit. And there's a meeting of the two. 
And when that happens, then you and I will bust out in praise for his love and his power and his grace and his mercy. But also not just worship of the spirit, but worship in truth. Personally, I believe that means, first of all, we have to approach God truthfully. There's no mask. There's no facades, no put ons. I come to him open with a pure heart. But it also means that you and I need to base our worship on what? The truth of God's word. My friend, we don't worship any old God. We worship the God of the Bible. But it also means that when you and I come to God, we come only one way, and that's through the truth. And Jesus said, say it with me, I am the way, truth, life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what it means, I believe, to worship in truth. That you and I come truthfully. You and I come based upon the truth of God's word and only through the, the truth, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says you got to have both. You cannot pick and slant your worship just in one direction. True worship is the worship that approaches God in truth and in spirit. And thirdly, False worship is superstitious worship. Too many people worship God not out of their need and desire, but out, out of fear that, that maybe something bad will happen if I don't worship God. It, it's a duty and an obligation. Oh, my friend, I hope that your worship is not out of fear, but it's out of love. It's out of devotion to the Lord. It's out of gratitude. See, false worship says this. Oh, I got to go to church today. You know what true worship says? Yippee! I get to worship God today, any place, any time, and even at the church house. Anybody hear the difference? Not duty and obligation, but a wonderful opportunity. To worship our Father. Well, if that's false worship, what is authentic worship? I want to give you six ingredients real quick that I find in the Scripture that are included in authentic worship. First is declaring God's pur purpose in the new contemporary version or the new century version, Psalm 47. God is king of all the earth. So sing a song of praise to him. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. You see, God is the God of all gods. He is the Lord of all. Lords. He isn't some town mayor. He isn't a Washington, D.C. diplomat. He is the king who sits on the throne of the universe. I read a while back ago. The words of a TV preacher's wife that really irked me. She said, so I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it really for God. You're doing it all for yourself because you see, God wants you to be happy. Amen? That's heresy. That's not supported by the scripture. Oswald Sanders was right when he said, we used to think that the chief end of man was to glorify God, but ah, oh, not today. Today we're tempted to say the chief end of God is to gratify man. See, authentic worship is all about who? Not you, but God. Declaring how great he is. And centering our attention and our binoculars on him. Something else that's included in authentic worship is thanksgiving for God's provision. Psalm 126, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. And then they said, among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. 
I want you to take a moment. And I want you, and I'll give you a moment of time. I want you to think of, of what God has done for you in the last couple of weeks. Would you do that? Just pause and think. What has he done for you? And now, if you're bold enough, would you mind sharing that with somebody nearby? Just one thing that God's done for you in the last couple of weeks. Go ahead. Go ahead. Share. What's he done? Nothing? I'll bet he has. You know what you just did? What you were involved in was worship. Because when you shared with somebody else what God had done for you, you're really thanking who? God for his provision. You know, we take so much for granted. You know what God should be hearing from me every day throughout the day? Woo! Thank you, God, for that. Jesus, I really appreciate you doing that. How often is he hearing that from you? Yesterday, Lucy and I were out walking in the neighborhood. And all of a sudden, we, we went by a house, and we didn't know these people. We know a lot of our neighbors, but we didn't know these. And Lucy noticed that the, the wife was on the front porch, and Lucy called out and said, Boy, there are lovely flowers in your planter. Well, you know what that led to? She actually got off the porch, walked to the street, and we had a wonderful 15-minute conversation. And it ended up with the three of us holding hands and we're praying for a sister in the Lord who just lost her cousin in a terrible accident. And when we left her place, I was praising the Lord, saying, thank you for a divine appointment, Lord. You orchestrated that whole thing. Thank you for the opportunity for ministry. And you see, that situation led to what? Worship. Worship. We ought to be thanking God all the time. Authentic worship also is celebrating God's promises. You remember when the wise men, they followed the star. They came to Herod. Where do, how can we find it? He didn't really know. So, you know, they go outside and guess what they saw again? And it was sitting right over Bethlehem. And that's where they found the Christ. You know what? That star was really God's promise to them. They felt in their heart that God promised that if they get to the end of where that star is, they're going to find a newborn king. And boy, did they. They found the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I remember singing as a child. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, and every line. All our blessings of his love divine. All the promises in the Bible are mine. Amen? This book is so full of promises. Now, a few of them deal with certain group of people like the Israelites. But almost all of them, you and I have here to claim from God. Wonderful promises like, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Save, what a promise. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And my God shall supply. Not all, but some, right? All your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And I can do all things through him, Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. God is magnified when we focus on his promises. And we begin to claim them and trust his faithfulness. I ask you today, are you focused? Are, are, are you claiming? Are you trusting his promises? Also, true worship means acknowledging God's presence. Psalm 139 says, where can I go with, from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, whoo, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remote parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me up. My friend, God is not a part-time God. He's in this very room. 
today. And if you belong to him, he promises that he is Jehovah Shema, the God who is there, the God who is here, and he will always be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Sunday school teachers teaching the four and five year olds. She's talking about the building of the, the tabernacle and, and finally in the temple. And, and when, when, when it finally was finished, she talked about the Lord God filling that, that, that particular temple with his presence. And all of a sudden, the eyes of the kids got so big. They were so excited. It didn't take her long to realize their joy was not in thinking that God was in the building. They were imagining that building that big filled with presents from the Lord. And are they any different than some of us? When we focus on the presence that God gives us and we don't focus on the fact that he is here. And in his local, right now where I am, presence in my life. The only thing that should matter when we come to worship is what? God is here. Also, True worship means rejoicing in God's path to life. Psalm 16 says, therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. It was the Bethany Missionary Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas that was sued by one of its members. Oh, let me clarify. One of its deacons. And he claimed that the herniated disc that he had in his Bible, in his back, was all due to the church. See, here's his reasoning. In a service prior to that, he was helping a fellow member who got so excited during the pastor's sermon. And when I read that, when I read that, I said, you know, there's a whole lot of churches that ought to have that going on. Is worship supposed to be drudgery? Is it supposed to be exciting? We're in God's presence. You know, when I think about that, when you come to worship and really worship, God will always call us, speak to us. But you know, I'm sure that Pastor Mike will agree with me that when we look out on a Sunday morning, sometimes, I know this is hard to believe, but we see a few sour faces. I know it's not you. You know? Tell that person next to you, put on a smile. Go ahead. Why should we be sour here? Why? This should be an exciting place. Think about it. We're in the presence of Almighty God, the one who's on the throne. That's where we are. God has given us this guidebook. How many know that this world is filled with landmines? You want to get blown up? You want to escape them? You stay in God's word. God's given us purpose in life, my friend. I'm not aimly going through this life. I know where I'm going. God gives me purpose for every day. The reason you are alive today is only because God's got purpose for your life. We ought to celebrate that for the Lord. And because of God's mercy and grace, I, I now am on a very narrow road that's heading to life. Because you see, I used to be on a very wide road that was headed for destruction. I'll tell you what, I, I'm a sports fan and I get excited. And sometimes I might even raise my voice 
and even sometimes lift my hands. And why can't we do that in the presence of Jesus? Am I right? You know, I'm not telling you how to worship, but shouldn't we be excited when we get to be in his presence and worship him? Also, sixthly, I believe that authentic worship uh, includes responding to God's personal call. Listen to Psalm 37. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take the initiative and they take refuge in him. See, when you come to worship and really worship, I believe God will speak to you. God's going to call you by name. And he's going to call you either to salvation or a deeper commitment to him in your walk or your deeper commitment in your service. And when he does, if we're truly worshiping the Lord, we're going to say, yes, sir, I'm ready for duty. I'm going to respond to you. I'm following you, Lord. If you're not changed in worship, are you listening? Then you haven't worshiped. Because how can your spirit connect with God's spirit and you walk away unchanged? It can't happen. God is ready to make some wonderful changes in your life. But you're the one that has to place your faith in the Lord. Our worship as individuals and as a church should be regardless of the style. Wow. Worship. Let me talk about that real quick. Let me explain to you what wow worship is. That's when you and I leave this service and we don't say, man, that was some great music. I'm the first to say, Devin and the choir and the praise team knock it out of the park every week. Amen. But worship's more than that. And worship is not when you and I leave this, this place and say, Woo! Pastor Mike really did it this morning. Well, he does. Brother, there's never a Sunday that I sit under your preaching that God doesn't speak to me clearly, effectively, and convincingly. And I appreciate you. But you see, wow worship is when you and I leave this place and we say, Wow, what a great God we have. got to be our focus and for that to happen you and i need to come to this place or to our quiet time with four things and the first is a pure heart matthew 5 8 says blessed are the pure in heart for they will see god remember the binoculars when we focus on god he will become what magnified but notice the condition this verse puts on it What's necessary for him to become magnified? We've got to come and take off our mask and let God see our heart. He already sees it, but we need to take that initiative. When you come with a pure heart and, and, and an open heart, you're not pretending. You're not coming for show. You're coming all because of him. Do you remember when Jesus said you need to take the plank out of your own eyes to do what? To see clearly the speck in somebody else's eye. You see, the sin in my life keeps me from seeing you clearly. You understand that? But the sin in my life also keeps me from seeing who clearly. But if I take care of the sin in confession and honesty before the Lord, guess what happens? The plank is removed and all of a sudden God becomes magnified in my seeing, in my understanding. We also need to come to the Lord with a Holy Spirit focus, a God focus. It's His agenda, not ours. It's what He wants, not what we want. What do you think would happen in our quiet time or in Sunday morning worship time if we truly focused on Him? Think about that. What would happen? You think things might change around here? Think things might change in your life? 
See, James 4, 8 says this. Draw near to God and He will what? Don't you want to be near God? Don't you want to connect with God? Where does the initiative start? God's already here. He's ready for that to happen. You and I need to take the initiative. We need to take the binoculars on the, on the, on the railing on the back porch and begin to focus on Him. We need to move into God. And He promises when that happens, there's going to be a connection like you've never experienced before in your life. Or that wonderful verse, Matthew 6, 33, from the New Living Translation, it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Do you know what a kingdom is? It's where who rules? Rules. That means he's in charge. That means you're obedient. That means you come and say, God, whatever you want is what I want. And when that happens, things start to happen in your life. What's the very first phrase in the Bible? In the beginning, and what happened after that phrase? All of creation happened. How much, if in your quiet time this week every day, or in your worship, you begin with God? What do you think we can expect on the back end? Only what God can do. You get ready for wow. Because God's going to move when you start with him. We also need a real hunger and thirst. Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Or Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. What was he indicating? He was the water of life. And if you and I drink from him and come to him, what's going to happen? We will never thirst again. When you approach the worship, you should come wanting God's presence. You know, one of the, the, the constant prayers that I have for my wife, Lucy, and our two sons, our two daughter-in-laws, and our five grandchildren is this. I pray constantly something like this. God, I pray that you would give them a hunger and a thirst for you and for your word. Constant prayer. Constant prayer. A thirst and a hunger. See, too often times we hunger for what God can do for us. We thirst for our needs being met. You know, as a boy... I would have loved to spend an hour with Stan the Man Musial. Hall of Fame baseball player. Because he was my hero. Now I have to be honest with you. I, I really didn't want an autograph ball. And I, I, I didn't want a, a baseball cap or anything. I just wanted to hang out with somebody that I really thought a lot of. Guess what we're doing this morning? Guess who we're hanging out with? Talk to me. Who are we hanging out with? Oh, wow. Wow. He's here. Creator of our life, the Savior. See, prior to marriage, I dreamed and I longed for, when I was in college, time spent with Lucy. But we live states apart. So occasionally, when I, when I was able to do so... I left college in Annapolis, Maryland, and I would drive all the way down to North Carolina, way out in the country, 14 miles outside of Burlington, and then I'd have to be back by evening meal on Sunday. That, that was a long trip. That was a short time. But oh, oh, the moments. It was a wow time. You know it. You know what I'm talking about. You've lived some of those moments, didn't you? <laughs> Shouldn't we have that same kind of hunger and thirst to be in the presence of Almighty God? And what more? When we come, we need to come with a true hope. See, we need to come to worship with expectancy. We're meeting the Almighty and whenever he shows up, prepare for something awesome to happen. When, you know, we, we, we know that the Bible says you do not have because you do not ask of God. 
Can I clarify that a little bit or expand it? I believe you do not have because you do not expect God to provide. Just let's be honest with one another. Why in the world would he give you another blessing when you're not ready for it? Huh? He didn't deserve. I mean, you don't deserve one blessing from the Lord. Why would he give you another? If you're not ready to receive it and use it for his glory. We need to be expectant. You know, we should come to God with a hope that he has an answer for our difficulties. That he'll provide the wisdom and the strength that we need. We should enter worship with faith that says, according to Ephesians 3.20, that he will do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. This last Wednesday, when the men gathered for Bible study, one of the many verses that we looked at was Colossians 4, verse 2. It says it this way. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Think about that. Paul commands us to devote ourselves to what? And it's a part of worship. And then he says you do so with alertness and thanksgiving, or what's he saying? Expectancy. See, real prayer and worship connect with God. And when you and I connect with God, then we can expect only what God can do. Get ready for wow. When each worshiper comes to worship in that way, coming with a pure heart, a focus on the Holy Spirit and God, a thirst and a hunger for Him and a true hope, then God's going to move like you've never seen Him move before. And then all we'd be able to do is just stand and say, wow. I'm sure you've heard of Johnny Erickson Tata. She's a, she became a quadriplegic through a diving accident at the age of 17. She hasn't walked or known feeling in her legs for over four decades. One time she was attending a convention and the speaker closed his message, was asking everybody to get on their knees for the, for the prayer. Although God knew her heart was kneeling, she began to cry because she wanted to physically kneel before her Lord. And part of her prayer, through the tears of passion, she said this, Lord Jesus, I can't wait for the day when I will rise up on resurrected legs. And the moment I do, I will fall on grateful, glorified knees in worship of you. God wants us to kneel in worship. God wants us to stand in worship. God wants us to sing in worship. God wants us to study his word in worship. God wants us to live out our worship in everyday speaking and actions. Hear the psalmist call out to you and me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Christian. The altar's open for you to, to come and get right with God. And he's, many of us may need to come and say, God, I haven't been worshiping you like you deserve. Give me that heart. God, give me that thirst and, and that hunger, God, for you. God, help me to begin to truly worship you for all you are, for all that you do. Or maybe... You need to say, I'm, I'm feeling the Lord tugging at my heart. And he wants me to become a, a member of this great church and, and help this church reach this community for Christ. Pastor Mike will be at the front, and, and he certainly would welcome you on behalf of the church into this wonderful body. Also, the doors of this church are, are open for sort of somebody to say, man, you know, I, I've never given my heart to Jesus, and, and today I want to do so. I want him to become my Savior and my Lord. I want, to, I want to know that purpose that Pastor Steve talked about in my life today. You know, there's no greater worship than when you and I hear from the Lord and then do what he says. Pastor Mike. Lord. Let's pray. Father God, first of all, I need to come before you, Lord. 
and just ask you to hear my cry, Lord. Father, I need to ask for forgiveness for sin. What am a sinner here? I'm still in these old ragged clothes, Lord. Father, forgive me. Forgive me for putting me first. Forgive me for not giving my life and all to you and who you are. Father, thank you for Pastor Stephen, that message this morning of conviction. Lord, help me, strengthen me, strengthen all of us here to deny ourselves, to deny ourselves and carry our own crosses daily, Lord. Help us to not forget that when we leave here. Father, thank you for Bethel Colony. Thank you for what it means to so many men, Lord. And Father, I just pray that this church next week will come in abundance and bring with them not just food, but grace and love from you. Help us to show these men that there is hope and there is victory through Jesus Christ. Father, again, I thank you for today. I thank you for this service, and I thank you for you. Help me to be who you created me to be, each one of us here as well, Lord. And we ask that we do all things to your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen.